Welcome to the Top m and Entrepreneurs. Today my guest is Linda Rose. Linda started in working with Arthur Anderson a long, long time ago. And then she started three businesses that were acquired. And she started an m and advisory service where she's worked on 12 acquisitions. Welcome to the show, Linda. Thanks, John. Thanks so much for having me. I am uh, interested to hear about this journey because... I, I, I'm an ex into it guy, so I love financial numbers. So, uh, how this skill pertains to the way you look at businesses and how you help them sell and get them in shape. So, let's talk about where you started at uh, back at Arthur Anderson. How did that go? So, yeah, I don't want to bore you with the details, but um, I decided pretty early on in life that I wanted to be a CPA. I didn't really even know what that meant. And so I was able to fast track my way through college, I actually got a master's degree in taxation, ended up at one of the big eight accounting firms, which is now big four. I met my husband there who was more senior than I was. You couldn't date, let alone get married back then. And since he had like eight years of seniority on me at the firm and it was up for partner, I just totally did not want to ruin that for him. And I think by then I was like four years into that career, I decided spouting code sections wasn't really my idea of a good time. And plus I like to ski and, you know, as a tax accountant, you can't, you can't take off between January 15th. And <laughs> no, you can't. That's not the season That's for tax season. accounts. So, yeah. you know, that was out. Um, so I left public accounting and so one thing after another kind of happened, got married, had a baby, did some gig work as we call it today ended up implementing a DOS-based accounting system for a boat company here in San Diego. And that started my career in technology. It was just not a planned event. And I started my first company. And then about, oh, 10 years later, I started my second company, which was a staffing firm uh, to help staff all these biotech companies that we were getting that needed accountants to come in and help implement this accounting system that I just put in place. And then after that, I started a cloud infrastructure business because, uh, you know, we were moving towards the cloud, although Balmer had not deemed it the cloud just yet, but it was ASP back in the day. So I started that yeah. in 2000. And so there was a period of time there for like eight years, I was running three companies. It was kind of crazy, but it did teach me how to delegate and have good people surround me. So that was a very good lesson. And then 2008, I sold the first company, which was my staffing firm. 2013, I sold the consulting slash um, ERP CRM firm to a national CPA firm. And then in 2017, I sold the cloud infrastructure business to a PE firm, 100% cash, walked out the door 45 days later. Wow. I started hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. Went on a lot. How big, is, uh, how big was that company, the Rose ASP, the one you sold to the private equity firm? People wise, not that many. We were below 15, but we had three, 400 customers. Uh, we focused on highly regulated companies, SOX compliance, F CF, uh, FDA, CFR part 11, people who um, were heavily into the healthcare space and needed a higher level of security and regulation and just, you know, taking care of their data, which we managed in private data centers at the time because Azure and some of the other public clouds weren't where they are today. And that allowed us to really have pretty high margins and it was a very sticky business. We had about a 95% recurring, um, I'm sorry, we had 98% recurring revenue, but a 95% customer retention rate. So between the two of them, and they were three-year contracts, we were pretty golden. So I, that's what allowed me to walk out the door so quickly. Yeah. So what kind of offer was that? Was that based upon the cash flow, reoccurring cash flow? Um, yeah, it was a, it was a EBITDA multiple, which I can't talk about obviously, but yeah, it was pretty good. It was all cash though. So I'm not complaining. It was all cash. Like, Hey, let's take our business. Let's just add it right into our customers. So how did you get into this uh, Rose biz, which is M&A advisor where you've been involved to 12? Yep. Yeah. So I was 55 at the time when I sold my business and I, just kind of thought for sure, you know, well, I shouldn't say I thought for sure. I just realized that I probably wasn't ready to retire yet. So right after I sold the business, I went on a 500 mile backpacking trip through 
Oregon and Washington and I had no cell service. So it was kind of like out in the winter wilderness, sleeping in a tent every night, basically used my phone just for an app to figure out where my next camping spot was, where the next water was. And, you know, 500 miles gets, gives you a lot of time to think. I was doing 15 to 20 miles a day and some of it was on my own. I actually met some other hikers along the way and hiked some with them, but it just gave me an opportunity to think about what I might want to do next in my life because I realized I am an entrepreneur. This is what I love to do. I still like to make money, even though I didn't need to make any more money, but that's kind of who I am. And I came out of the backside of that deciding I was going to write a book because somewhere along that trail, I ran into a guy from the Czech Republic who was also hiking the trail and he had flown over here to do it. And we started hiking together because we had the same pace. And he was a system engineer and I just told him about what I'd just been through selling my company, which there were good things about it and not so good things about it. And he's like, you need to write a book. And so there you go. It's right up there. I spent the next 18 months when I got off the trip. Get acquired for millions. You wrote my book, Get Acquired for Millions. Yep. And it really, the book is, it's not an M&A book. It's, I think it's more like a CEO handbook Bible on how to get your company ready to sell. And I talk about every single mistake I made over the three personal company sales that I did, two on my own, one with a broker. Um, I Even with a broker, I left money on the table absolutely unequivocally, I know that today. But I talk about all that because I was very passionate about making sure that people who spent 20, 30 years building a business and had one opportunity to sell it, that they did it right. So that's what the book was about. And even before the book came out um, on Amazon, people, you know, because I started advertising that the book was coming out, people started calling me and said, hey, Linda, we followed you all these years in the Microsoft channel because I was in that channel for about 25 years. And like, can you help us sell our company? And that's kind of how it started. So, so now I would say today, half my clients know me for many, many years. And the other half of my clients are just meeting me for the first time, but no, I know technology, which is unusual to find somebody that's been in the CEO role that knows financials really well and understands M and A incredibly well. And so that was kind of a convergence of all my skill sets. So I kind of feel like I'm in the best career of my life, although I try to only do it part time. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to ask you back on this: so like, how did you know you left money on the table? Because um, I. I sold a business and it sold within, I put it on a broker site and it sold within 48 hours. Did I leave money on the table? Probably. Probably. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know I left money on the table because well, of, of what I know now, but my broker didn't help me with EBITDA adjustments. I had to come up, you know, normalizations. I had to come up with those all by myself. Like he didn't do that. Like he hid behind this guise of, well, I'm not FINRA authorized. So I really can't help you do that, which I don't agree with that statement. I don't see the connection. Anyway, so knowing what I know now, I I totally left money on the table. Um, I mean, they and the buyer also said, "Oh, we're going to replace you. Or we're going to replace, you know, your husband because we worked together and we both exited immediately." And they're we're going to replace you, and that was at the time six hundred thousand dollars a year worth of salary plus payroll taxes. Like, did I add that back? Uh, no, but they never replaced us kind of thing. I think it was a little bit of a ploy to keep the price down, so to speak, right? Because it never even attempted to replace us. So, you know, it's a few things like that where knowing what I know today, um, I'm wise to all that stuff. And I really spend a lot of time with my clients because again, I'm a CPA in a former life. I spend a lot of time with my clients if they're not doing their own quality of earnings report before they go to market. I really work with them on defining and and uncovering all those normalizations to help increase that that valuation in the end yeah that sounds like back to just that story of the broker i mean was he sounds like he was just kind of transactional and just want to make the sale happen like yep. i'll go to the next yep. person yep nice guy but also nice guy. the private nice equity firm should have stood up and said you know if they're going to pay cash for this like yeah it's six hundred thousand dollars what's that what really big difference is that going to be to them you know, they always want to get the best deal possible. You know, I've met a lot of PE firms uh, selling the companies that I've sold. Some of them are more difficult to deal with than others. Some of them are just more 
forthcoming than others. You know, every, every group is different. Uh, you see really kind of everything in this space. So yeah. You see some brokers that are better so, than others. So just part for the course. How, you wrote this book, it came out. How, how did you find the first customer and said, Hey, Linda, I need your help to sell my company. Uh, first three found me. First three, first three found you. Actually, yeah. yes. Actually, my largest client, um, who was eighty million in revenue, found me via a blog post that I wrote, which was a kind of a random thing because I just started writing blog posts. Um, now my website has, you know, probably a hundred posts, if not more, and because our team or I put out posts religiously each week via email newsletter or you know actually a blog on our site. Again to take the book beyond, you know, to expand on the book, to learn more things. Cause every deal I close, I learn more things as well. And I share those lessons learned with, uh, the CEOs that, uh, basically, you know, follow my newsletter. So let me ask you about this. Uh, when you find a company like this, $80 million and you start looking at their books, you're going to, you're going to look at their books and say, you know, let's do the ad backs, let's do the adjustments. And maximizing, you're not really maximizing. You're just saying this is your true EBITDA or cash flow. Yeah, well, in in that that was a very interesting project. Um, even though they were so large in revenue, they were just coming off of QuickBooks and they had just moved on to Netsuite. And you would think with eighty million dollars in revenue, they were accrual based accounting. And so that was one of the first things I asked. You know, how's your accounting? Are you fully GAAP? Oh yeah, we, we, you know, we're accrual based and, you know, in their mind, because they had accounts receivable and accounts payable, they were accrual based, you know, they weren't, they were doing a horrible job of matching revenue and expense in the same month. So I would look at their P and L by month and I'd see months where the cost of goods sold was greater than the sales. And I'd see months where we'd have $2 million losses and another month there's a $3 million gain. And it was just huge roller coaster on the bottom line. So they weren't really using accrual. They were not, no. So we spent uh, six months, probably six to nine months getting their books in order. We got an outside CPA firm involved. Um, I think we had a quality of earnings report done as well, just to, just to get their books in order. And um, just as we were getting ready to close a deal, we were two weeks to close, COVID hits, everything falls apart. And we went back to market immediately and went to buyers number two, three, and four, and actually, believe it or not, was able to get a, a better price. So it worked out in the end for everybody, but it, you would think, you know, a company of that size would have great accounting and that's not necessarily the case. It's not how, how large you are necessarily. No, no. It sounds like it just got away from them. I think a little bit of that. And they just didn't do the things they needed to do early on. You know, because they worked off a of cash flow. You know, their tax return yeah. was based on a cash basis. So it was on a cash basis. What, what did that do? Trans? How did that transform their cash flow, their income statements? What did it look like after you implemented true accrual accounting? Well, it put all the revenue in the right years because remember we were looking at three years worth of revenue plus the current year, so we had to shift revenue from one year to another, and it just really made it look much nicer and you could see really the growth versus this constant rockiness on the bottom line. So it, it really demonstrated more of a true picture of the company versus this cash flow life that they were living under, which, you know, it depends on when the money comes in and when the money goes out. So, you know, right, right, right. Did, how did, how did you know this person was uh, motivated to sell? They said, I, I'm out of here. I got, or I got a health problem. I totally want to retire. Like, yeah, they, it was I, I just find the reason I ask that is I just find some people say, yes, if you offer me $10 million for $1 million company, happy to retire. So, but in reality, it's like I'm out of gas. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where they were. I, I spend a lot of time talking to sellers and I, I do sell side representation only. So I spend a lot of time talking to sellers about, you know, how emotionally ready are you to do this? and what's happening for you in the next season of your life. Because if you don't have something to move on to, some people can't pull that trigger. Some people can't sign on the dotted line at the end because they're like, I don't know what I'm gonna do next. Now, that was kind of me in a way, but you know, I had my, my husband in the background going, no, sell the money. I mean, sell the company and, and go get the cash. Let's move on to something else. And you know, I wasn't sure what I was gonna do, what my next step was, but 
you know, you, you find your passions, I think over time. And some people are, you know, some people know that they're going to retire and go to the lake house and water ski and golf and tennis and all that. And other people go, yeah, I'm not ready for that yet. I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but I'm not working for somebody else. So, you know, they, they hesitate a little bit. So I think it's really important mentally, emotionally, that you figure that out before you go through that process. And I do that really early on with the clients that want to work with me. I just make sure that they are ready for that next stage of their life. And we're not at the 11th hour and they're like, you know what? I can't do this. So it's yeah. never happened to me, thankfully. Not, not yet. Oh, good. I hope it doesn't. It's not happen. Uh, do, do, you, do you ever work on a business and say, you know, Look, if you're wanting, you, a lot of these M&A advisors, they say, if you want to work backwards, you want to have a transformational exit, you need your EBITDA to be 8X. So, but you're only at 4X right now, which means we need to add two more million dollars to your EBITDA. Do you also work on that side too? Yeah, I'm starting to do that as well, where we're putting people together and, and, and doing some quick um, roll-ups before we go to market. Yeah. Yep. Well, great. You've been involved in three acquisitions of your own, so you know how to do that. Um, it, w how did that second one look, the, the second customer that came to you? What what size were they? Kind of, you can give that, me a range. That, was, that yeah. was the $80 million customer. The first one. Oh, that was the second one. Yeah. The first one was actually a friend and a business acquaintance from many years, a uh, smaller company, but a very interesting situation. And you know, she she got a pretty good deal for her company, one year earn out. She stuck around for two years and exited. Um, the one after that is again, somebody I'd known in the channel. Uh, we sold her to a national CPA firm. Uh, she got a good amount of cash up front and then a two year earn out and she's now since retired. So, you know, people, usually have a, a journey that they want to take. Some folks, I just, I just closed a portfolio company uh, in January where the seller is um, going to stick around for five years, five to seven years and, and take that next bite at the apple. And he's very excited to do it. He's got a group behind him that will allow him to make additional acquisitions. And so he's excited about that. And we got him 12 offers. So he had lots of choices in terms of- 12 offers? Yeah, 12 offers. To go. Yeah, yeah. 12 offers. Mm -hmm. And how do you create that? Uh, well, you know, the process of taking somebody to market, uh, put them in front of a lot of buyers. and But he was a really strong company, a lot of recurring revenue, strong customer base, some IP. So, you know, a lot of good things going for him, over $3 million in EBITDA as one company. So it was, it was, a, it was a nice company. Was it, then, uh, was reoccurring? Go ahead. No, I was going to say I've had larger companies. Um, the year before that, I had a very large company, probably close to 40 million in revenue, but one customer represented 90 plus percent of their revenue. Big customer, uh, but uh, that was a tough one, right? We had a lot of- And what do you products. tell them? Like, so let, let me give you an example. I, I was on Woodbridge uh, Group they sell larger companies. They don't put a valuation on it because they don't want to put a price on it because somebody, a portfolio company might look at them and just roll it up. Uh, right. There's one customer does IRX task planning. They have two customers in the business are responsible 100% of the revenue. I wasn't interested because it's too much risk. I mean, so what do, you, what do you do in that case? Are you just looking for a specific person that could tuck it in type yes, of company or what? That's exactly what happened. Yeah, it was, it was, there were two risk items here. One of them was the high customer concentration. And the second one, it was a woman owned business certified company. Right. So, yeah. and, and, you know, the, the reality is most women owned businesses are not going to get bought by another woman owned business. They're going to get bought by a non women owned business. So that certification could be an issue for the buyer. And in this case, you know, we had, we had to get past that as well, but we got a really nice deal done. It was a roll up to a much larger uh, company. So that 98 or 93% customer concentration just kind of melded once you, you know, put it in the pot with everything else. It was no longer such a high concentration. So it worked out. Yeah. When you say woman owned, is that because she was able to get contracts for being a, a female, yeah. right? I'm yeah. familiar with a government yeah. business. And that's what they do. They set aside contracts for specific groups. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
You know, Um, most women start out that way. And I did as well. I got a women owned business certification. I think over time you tried to get business without that certification. And I think, but I talked to many women who still maintain that and then they, they swear up and down. It's what gets in the business. And, you know, I advise them and say, look, you know, if you are planning on selling, you need to drop that certification and be able to show the buyer that you can maintain that business, especially if it's somebody that you have to re up with every year that you can maintain that business without your certification. And that's the only way to really demonstrate that, that someone's still working with you without that certification. But that's a hard thing to do. And what I tell people to do is like, you know, go get the certification, just don't file it. And of course you're going to get 10 emails that says, Hey, we haven't got your filing. And you, you just, you know, then you have to say, you know, we're not going to, we have it. We just don't want to use it anymore. And then see what the response is. Right. And if they're like, okay, no problem. They just can't check that box with you and they move on. But usually by then they've had a great five year, 10 year role with you. And you know, they're obviously using you because not because you're women owned, but because you're providing great value in your services and your products. Yeah. Did the buyer of that company uh, discount your multiple because there was a high risk in there and that there was women owned? Did they? No, no, they didn't. No. Um, what we did do instead is, is put an earn out in there that would extend beyond that period where the certification was required. So really there was like a three year earn out so that we could prove out that that revenue was going to continue on. And so that's kind of a traditional private equity model where they're buying 60, 66% of the business. She stays in for a second bite of the apple if they sell that portfolio to another larger company. Yeah. And she did roll some equity. So, yeah. Yeah. And how long ago was that? Yeah. How long ago was that? Yeah. Is that, uh, have you had any conversations with her that the earnout is performing better yeah, earn out than expected? Well. Yeah. Yes. She's, she's Beautiful. killing it. Yeah. Yeah. So how are these now, these other customers like four and you say you've been involved in 12, four, five, six, et cetera. They're coming from your work, getting acquired for millions, blog posts and everything. They're coming to you. Is it just technology or just niching it to that? I am just niching it to that. I don't go beyond that at all. Yeah. Stay within that lane. I mean, I spent 25 years in technology. I understand MSPs. I understand the difference between an MSP and an MSSP, which not every broker does. Um, you know, I understand data centers. I understand app dev. You know, I lived that life for 25 years. I did some aspect of that for the last 25 years. And so I know that well. Uh, so when a company like that comes to me, I can step back, look at everything they do. And I think do a really good job of articulating their value proposition because I do understand their technology and I can explain to a buyer, hey, this is where I think this company will excel. If you either buy it as a portfolio company or as a tuck in, you know, here's the upsell, cross sell opportunities here. So, you know, because I know this space so well, I feel like I can do this really well. And I don't feel like I need to go beyond the IT space at all. And if you look at my book, it's a roadmap for technology service providers. I mean, you, you couldn't niche down any more on the book, right? <laughs> it is not no. for everybody. Although I've had people outside of technology, you know, email me or text me at like an, at an engineering firm. And I had some lady that was, I forgot what business she was in. Um, totally outside of technology people email me and say oh my god i loved your book and it really helped me and so there's a lot of things in there that just don't relate to technology only but i do talk about ip and recurring revenue and contracts and things like that that somewhat you know are more relevant to technology than not but um you can any any industry can get value out of this book yeah yeah i'm just curious uh there are some insurance companies uh buy side won't cover uh, wraps and warranty insurance on MSPs because there's so much risk to credit card stuff. Is is that a concern in in that industry? You know, I haven't had too many issues there. Um, you know, we always get tail insurance for a number of things. Uh, it really depends on what the buyer is requiring. And then even I suggest that my seller get tail insurance on other things just to so that they're not looking over their shoulder for things afterwards. Yeah, it's just get the insurance. I haven't had yeah. any I haven't had any issues in the deals that I've been in, so thankfully. Yeah. 
So what, what were some of the stickiest points that you had to overcome through the negotiations? Like every buyer comes up then he goes, I'd like to buy you. And something comes up, even though it's unintentional from the seller, yeah. it comes up and you have to deal with it. You know, I think the I think the one issue I'm seeing a lot of all of a sudden is um, a lot of people over the time have have bought the building that they're in. So they have an entity that owns the building and then they have their entity that does, you know, the MSP work, whatever. But what happens, especially if you get an SBA loan as part of that, the SBA loan will use the entity that you want to sell, which is your MSP as collateral. And so obviously that becomes a problem. You a big problem, obviously in a stock sale and even in an asset sale, it becomes a problem because the buyer wants to make sure everything is unencumbered. So, you know, unless you plan on paying off the loan for the building, which many of these guys, you know, picked up their loans in the last five years and you're not going to get that kind of interest rate or there's some huge prepayment penalty, especially, you know, with the SBA loans, you have to think twice if you're going to do that. Right. So that actually I've had three deals right now where that's exactly the situation where that the seller owns a building and it's being collateralized by the company they want to sell. So, and, and it, you would say, okay, no problem. We collateralize the loan and put it on the building and not the, the company and the assets of the company easier said than done. Yeah. Because SBA, you can get a 25 year loan at 10.5 right now, I'm sure dating myself, uh, which includes the business. And that, would be an encumbrance with its causes just kind of more deep uh, technicalities with it or what? Yeah. yeah. That's as of late, that's been the biggest showstopper. Um, you know, I've sold four women owned businesses and of course, well, we talked about that already. That's always, that always comes up in every one of those deals. Um, so yeah, I, th I would say those are the biggest ones. Um, is your husband still involved in the what you're no, doing now? No, he, he no. totally retired. <laughs> He's like, I'm, I'm going to get this out. <laughs> yeah. And how many hours are you working a week? Because I just talked to another kind of M&A advisor, and he's like semi-retired. He's trying to work 20 hours a week, and that's it. You know, I work more than that right now, partially because I'm also writing a course. I've been writing a course for the last two years. It's almost like another book. And... Uh, I wanted to put a course out into the world for sellers again, to help them prepare. It, it kind of spins off the book a little bit. It's an online course. I've been really, it's, I've got seven modules with maybe three to five lessons under each module. So there's probably about 35 lessons there and, you know, between scripting it, recording it and putting all the handouts that go with it. It's a tremendous amount of work. I think it's almost more work than the book was. Um, so, I probably been working more like 30, 35 hours a week, maybe not 35, but 30. If I'm not doing that, it goes in peaks and valleys, right? If I'm not in the middle of closing a deal, if I'm in the middle of closing a deal, man, we're talking day and night, like M&A has no eight, nine to five, right? It's a 724 business. Yeah, you're gonna get calls in the middle of the night. Hey man, we gotta resolve this. Exactly. Yeah. Or my clients, like, I've been thinking about this. Can we, can I bounce this off of you? Like, this is really bothering me or something, you know, or can we renegotiate this point or whatever? Right. So you, you're available to your clients day and night. At least I think the good M&A advisors are. And so, you know, when I'm down to the last two, three weeks, it is a full-time job. No question about it. But the rest of the year, you know, um, maybe if I didn't work on the course, maybe 20 hours a week tops. Yep. So if you work backwards uh, to the moment that they get a big check in their bank account and it's an emotional roller coaster, how do you provide an even keel, you know, steady, calm waters for them and say, hey, we'll be all right. We're going to do this. Um, well, I think one of the things I do, and it's, a, it's an exercise also in my course, is I have a net cash at close spreadsheet so that we can... Uh, go because you know you get an offer for ten million. I'll use ten million because it's a nice round number, and you know you immediately assume, okay, I got ten million. I'll get to put in the bank. Oh no, that's not the case because there's going to be no, an escrow a... for you know half a million or something like that, or a million. There is going to be some uh, bonuses that you're going to want to pay your employees. There's going to be um, that's the country club number. 
<laughs> yeah, there's some networking capital adjustments that may be in there. There's some attorney's fees. You have your M&A fees. So that $10 million all of a sudden isn't $10 million anymore. And then, you know, I, I kind of work through a little bit of a tax calculation with them. I'm not their tax advisor, but I want them to think about taxes. You know, what part of this is capital gain? What part of this is ordinary? What are your federal taxes that are going to come out of here? What are your state taxes that are going to come out of here? Now, I recommend they use a financial planner really for that, but I have created a worksheet that they could just kind of look at it big picture and go, well, that 10 million right now has come down to like six and a half, right? Because of all the things that need to get taken out. Now, of course, you're probably going to get those escrow amounts back, you know, in 18 months, but, and then there may be some earn out there that's going to happen in year two and year three or in six months or one year, that kind of thing. But I, I, I put them through that spreadsheet so they know early on what the number is going to look like and to know if that number is going to be sufficient for them because they don't think about all those things. They don't think about the employee bonuses, whether that's a sale bonus or a retention bonus or giving them part of the earn out or maybe even doing something on an equity rollover or you are rolling over some equity, right? They don't think about the escrow. They don't think about the networking capital peg and, you know, leaving money behind or taking money out, that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I have a question about that. I, I'm going to jump onto this. Like, so you find a business that's doing $6 million and it's been run for 20 years. They got $3 million in the bank in cash or equivalents. Uh, which way do you go? Do you recommend the buyer buy the cash or the seller take it out beforehand? I think and I know there's different taxes yeah. based upon how they... If you're an S-corp, a pass-through entity, or a C-corp. I, I, there's a different analysis that goes on. Yeah. So it does oh, start with the ending. Yeah. If they're an S -corp, the yeah. If they're an S corp, it's possible they've been taxed on that cash already, right? It was just sitting there because it, uh, via a pass through, right? So at that point, you just get it out of there as a distribution, right? So that's pretty right. simple. But as C corp, that gets a little bit more complicated. Right. To buy the cash, the stock, or, yeah. or just an asset purchase sale. Well, that's beautiful. And, uh, I love this work you're doing. Are you, uh, if somebody was going to come to you and say, well, I, let me go back to this. And how do you get paid? Do you get paid on a monthly basis in a percentage of the sale uh, at sale? Yeah. So uh, d different ways. I usually have an upfront retainer initially. And then with the longer projects, and I usually know if they're going to be a long, longer project, I'll do then a monthly retainer as well. But then usually I get paid at the end when the, when the company gets sold, success fee. At the yeah. End. And you like what you're doing? Yeah, I love what I do. I love what I do a lot. I think it's a, a perfect uh, melding of all my skills, you know, between being an accountant in a previous life, being a tax accountant, um, having run multiple companies, having sold multiple companies and understanding the the emotional baggage that goes along with this. When do you tell your people? How do you protect yourself when you pay out all these bonuses? What do you do to do that? Um, when do you include them into discussion? When to not include them into discussion? You know, there's all these other questions that happen along the way that unless you've lived that life, it's hard to put yourself in their shoes. But since I've done it multiple times, um, you know, and I did it different each time in terms of when I told my management team, when I didn't tell my management team, um, it, it, you know, those things come up. People ask me, well, how much should I give away in bonuses? Well, let's talk about this. You know, it may not be completely on tenure. It may be um, more on, you know, what's the ongoing value that they're, they're going to provide for you? Um, do you need these people to help make your earnout? In which case I recommend giving them part of the earnout, right? As well to keep them incentivized and keep them there if that is so critical, especially if you plan on moving on within, if there's like two year earn out and you want to, you know, exit left or right in one year, you need to have those people continuing to work for you and make that earn out. So you need to give them part of that. So, you know, we talk about that, um, so many things that come up and I think it's kind of hard. It's easier for me to provide that guidance because I've been in their seat and I know w emotionally what that means. And, you know, when I, emotionally, it is a, if you've been an open book with your management team and all of a sudden you can't tell them there's a potential opportunity or a deal going on, or maybe you don't tell them after you sign the LOI because you don't want to create this fear and doubt 
you know, certain, un, you know, uncertainty. Oh, and yeah. Doubt in Your mind place, takes right? you in the worst places. Yeah. You'll freak out. Yeah. Right. And then it's like, okay, well, even when you sign the LOI, which was in my case, I really wasn't totally sure if the deal was going to happen still. Right. We were still kind of working through some stuff. And so it's like, well, when do you tell these guys? And, and then also, you know, you want them to be part of that decision process in the end too, because especially if you need them for the earnout or um, they're critical to the ongoing success of the company, you want them to buy into that buyer as well. You don't want to just drop it in their lap and say, well, here it is, guys, here's who I picked. They want to feel like they've got some investment in this as well and maybe have helped make that decision. And so if you've run an open book and you've had to keep that to yourself, that's just such a mental drain on you. Um, you know, it just, you think, oh, well, it's just a secret I'm keeping, but mentally it is very draining to keep, hold that back from your team, especially if you've been used to being very open with your team. And yeah, I've yeah, talked to more yeah. sellers who got the day they could tell their management team that the transaction, a potential transaction was happening. They just felt this huge release off their shoulders. Like, they could breathe again, you know, because now they weren't hiding yeah. this big secret and now they could share with them, you know, here's the plans and here's what we need to do to close this transaction. And those are all the things I, wa I walk through with my sellers. So I, I really like the sell side. I've done a couple of intermediaries where I've represented both the buyer and the seller in the middle because I knew both parties and I knew it would be a good marriage, but that's rare. I really do really like more to be on the sell side. Yeah, I, I like your focus on uh, that being open and transparent to the employees about when you're going to sell. I, I interviewed a guy in the UK who said, here's what happened. I came into the office and the seller and I walked into the meeting with the group and the seller said, OK, I just sold the company. Here's a new owner. And he turned around and walked out. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. funny. Well, Linda, I really appreciate you spending time with me on Top M&A Entrepreneurs. And you got a great book, Get Acquired for Millions. Yep. You can find it on Amazon. And if you're interested in the course that I'm going to release, just go to my website, which is rosebizbiz.com forward slash wait list. And you'll get some idea of what the course is going to be, the modules that we have. I'm hoping to get it out in the April, May timeframe. So that's my goal. Yeah. Yeah. Work on those courses. The lessons. Well, thank you so much for being on my show. Thanks, John. It was so great to be here. All right. So let me stop this. I hope this video has inspired you. If you need help buying your first million dollar business, make sure to visit me at dealflowsystem.net. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe down below. Comment on it, share it, tell everyone about it. And thanks for watching.